Good morning. Um, my name is Joseph Teipel. I'll be talking for a bit today. Hopefully I won't be boring you too much. Um, but I hope this is a little bit more of a discussion than just a monologue. And so while I do have a presentation prepared, I was hoping that we could actually start just quick, go around the room, maybe name, co-op you're from, and just maybe one thing that you're hoping to take away from today or um, one thing that you're hoping to learn. Um, it'd be wonderful for me to get that perspective from you all about why you showed up, and um, then we'll get started. So I don't know if who I can put on the spot to start or if we want to have a volunteer start. Okay. I'll go first. Okay. Great. Is there something that you're hoping to take away from this session this morning? Yeah, I, I, I guess we're kind of at the phase where we're trying to set our trajectory for the store and figuring out like, you know, what we want our co-ops to look like because I haven't really focused on that much. I've been more focused on my vendor relations and building sales. And so now I'm kind of at the phase of like looking at our neighborhood, our geographical specific area in a food de desert on the north side of Youngstown. Like, what do we want? Yeah. So who are we going to be sourcing for funding? Are we going to work with grants? Are we going to, you know, reach into the community? Um, so. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm EJ Payne. I'm from Hillsboro, Oregon. And I can, I think you guys are in kind of a similar demographic with a variety of um, different people that live in your community and trying to figure out, I really want to figure out how we can serve everyone without having to do everything. Great. Thank you for being here. Johnny Albright, um, Indie Food Co-op, which is just up the road, um, doing business with Plus One Georgia, which just celebrated our fifth anniversary. Wonderful. Um, have a thousand members, but are really looking at the challenges of being um, delivering services to two sets of customers. One being the food desert that we're in, very very well needed, and, and then a lot of our shoppers. Okay, great. You want to go back or come forward? Go ahead. I'm Katie Nomad from Green Top Roasting in Bloomington, Illinois. And my sister lives in Denver, and so I'm really interested to hear. Wonderful. I'm also from Green Top Grocery Mountain, Wisconsin. And I'm just really interested in hearing what other co ops in the startup phase, like how they are moving forward, like just a few years ago. Great. identified a location yet so um, I'm, I'm interested in finding out how can we include the whole city or you know um, should we look to one area over another or my name is Rosemary Cooper I'm in Cultivate Cooking as well to echo Caitlin's point yeah trying to uh, create an inclusive community and to uh, generate dialogue amongst uh, at, at what population do you need to do food with the Rogers Park Food Club in Chicago. Um, we represent, we're in the startup phase as well, but we represent one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the country. So when I saw Debs, Young, Low Income, Largely Immigrant, I'm like, fantastic. <laughs> Case study, you can't, you can't get the information from other co-ops or anywhere else. It's the only place you can get the yeah. individual story. You can get the consultant story, you know, talk to them at any time and hear their, their, their philosophy and viewpoints. But that's the only place you get the case studies. And so I'm, I'm always curious to see how other people did it. Doing it, yeah. Not, we haven't, you know, we haven't finished anything, so. versus the committee and team and what we want 
for him mm. for what they want for themselves. Thank you for being here. Well, wonderful. Thank you all for, for going around and doing that. I know, realize it took a few minutes, but to me it's really important to know who you all are, and my hope is that I learn just as much from you all as you do from our story. Um, let me just try to get this working so I don't have to be standing right here in front of the screen the whole time. Um, okay, maybe. All right, I'm just going to go with it. I apologize if I'm kind of blocking a little bit, but I don't want to spend too much time messing with technology. So um, again, my name is Joseph Teipel. I'm director of operations and co-founder of Revision. And um, when folks ask me who I'm here with, I get confused when I'm answering, and then I'm sure people get confused when I answer. Um, and so what I'm here to do today is to share with you the story of the Westwood Food Cooperative. Um, but what I can't do is share with you that without talking about revision. Um, and in order to share about revision, I thought I'd share a little bit about where I came from and my journey towards revision. Um, and so my hope today is that I would take you from um, why myself and my friend Eric Kornack, who Dave mentioned, started revision in the first place, uh, what revision does, why we do it, uh, and then culminating into the Westwood Food Cooperative and where that movement is right now. Um, I welcome any and all questions, and if you'd like, what we can do um, is I'm, I'm not planning on this taking more than half an hour, 45 minutes, and then I'm hoping for discussion afterwards, question and answer. So if you do have questions, um, if you would like to, either raise your hand and we can jot them down on the poster board, um, or you can write them down and then, and then bring them back up in the question and answer. Um, so diving into a little bit of where I came from, I grew up right here in, in the Ar upper Arkansas River Valley in, in the mountains of Colorado. Tiny town, 2,500 people, one stoplight. Um, and I, I grew up here, um, my mom uh, was from England and she had a garden and loved gardening and I always hated pulling weeds but she made me do it anyways. Um, so I, she, she grew me up, she, she grew me up with this appreciation of wholesome food, of connecting with the earth. And even though I didn't realize it at the time, and I fought it at the time, that would kind of follow me through into um, what, what would become my life's work so far. Uh, I went to the University of Denver. Um, for my whole entire childhood, I wanted to be a police officer. I was like, I'm going to be a cop. And for some reason, an expensive private university and a criminology degree was the right way to get there. I don't know what I was thinking there. Um, but one of the reasons I actually chose the University of Denver was that it has an amazing focus on study abroad. Um, and it really allows the students that go there to experience different cultures, travel overseas, and learn. And that's something that I did quite frequently when I was there. I spent some time in New Zealand, some time in Spain, and most importantly, um, I spent some time in Nicaragua. Um, I worked with a women's cooperative down there, just helping on some really basic projects that they had. Um, but this was the first time, I mentioned my mom's from England, um, her family is spread all over, the, all over the world. I had done a lot of traveling growing up, but it was always to the developed world, quote unquote. And so this was my first experience in an undeveloped uh, country. And um, for me, it was earth shattering in many ways, and both in the negative sense and in the positive sense. I had grown up unquestioningly uh, believing in the American dream in, um, my, my parents were very much working class. I didn't have much money. All my clothes were all hand-me-downs. Um, but I had a stable home. Um, and I grew up not questioning any of that. 
And then I went to Nicaragua and I learned not only about their current state of affairs, how, how much they live in extreme poverty, how degraded their environment is, but I also learned a lot about my country's involvement in that, right? And how my country has affected the people there. And that made me question just about everything, right? And all of a sudden my world was upside down. I realized, hey, I don't have any answers. Um, and I also questioned that urge that made me want to be a police officer, which was I want to help people. And I realized maybe, maybe being a police officer is not the way that I want to do that. Maybe I want to try to do something about what I experienced here. Um, and what I did experience here was uh, amazing people, but also um, well-intentioned outside organizations coming in and trying to do community development, um, trying to hand the folks here something, whatever that was, whether it's a service or a good or food or whatever it was. Um, and oftentimes that movement would fall flat as soon as the organization left. Um, and so it was the cycle of dependency, right? Uh, and so that really triggered something in myself and my colleague, Eric. Um, and um, I also stayed with a coffee farming family in the mountains. This is Wilfredo. And actually a really amazing story and, and one that I'll circle back to um, was that I stayed with them for a week uh, in this remote, remote farm up in the mountains. It was a 45 minute hike from the nearest bus terminal, which was in a town that had one phone line and that bus then took two hours to get the regional capital, very remote. Um, but this gentleman, he's actually uh, the grandfather and those are some of his grandchildren that live on the farm. About two years later, I was sitting in my apartment in Denver. I picked up a magazine and his picture of his family was on an equal exchange ad. And I had learned when I stayed with him that he was part of a cooperative and he had converted to organic. And the cooperative had helped him install water filters uh, so that his family was no longer getting sick. Right? And to, to hear that story was amazing there. And then to see his picture and learn about equal exchange and the work that they've done um, was really, really impactful and, and really made a, a big sort of, um, a big impact in my story and why I would go on to kind of do a lot of this stuff. So I, as I mentioned, my friend Eric Kornacki and I, um, that's him. So this was us uh, towards the end of, of our Nicaragua trip, thinking very studiously. Um, but in, in all seriousness, um, this, this trip changed both of our lives. Um, he was on track to, to do economics, international studies, and um, this happened about halfway through, we spent, I spent a month there, the trip, the organized trip was about three weeks long. Uh, this was about halfway through my last year, both of our last years in college. And at that point, I couldn't change my major because I didn't have enough money to pay for more time at the school. Uh, but so I decided to finish out with criminology, but him and I both couldn't let go of, of the passions that this had stirred, the questions, the, the, the desires for change that, um, that this trip kind of engendered in us. So we started brainstorming, and initially we were thinking about starting an organization, um, but doing it uh, on sort of a grand scale, or kicking it off on a grand scale, by taking a bicycle journey um, from Alaska, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, down to um, Tierra del Fuego in, in the Patagonia region. Um, of Chile. And so 18,000 miles, we were thinking it was going to take 18 months. And, and we were doing all this planning out of all that passion that the trip had, had birthed in us, right? Of, of wanting to see change, of, of having anger and frustration at global socioeconomic issues and extreme poverty, environmental degradation, climate change, all these things, right? We were we were young and angry and, and thought we could make a difference by raising awareness primarily on this. But the other thing we wanted to do on this trip was um, try to start little bits of movements along the way. Uh, little nodes of places where people uh, could share the passion that we had for doing something differently. And then when we got back to Denver after the trip was done, we could help galvanize those movements and, and create larger change. That was the idea. So we, um, we were in route planning and sponsorship raising, and we had all the physical necessities down. We had the route, we had the equipment all lined up, we had the sponsors, we knew we could make the trip physically. We had been training and writing and all those things. But at the end of the day, we started realizing, okay, well, we spend 10 hours on the saddle, we roll into a community, we're outsiders. What are we gonna say that's actually gonna start anything? Right? What are we going to say that's other than 
can I please have a place to sleep, right? Um, so we, we, we realized this was going to be an adventure, but it wasn't really going to be what we wanted it to be. It wasn't going to be a movement starter. Um, I'm sorry? We were planning on starting in Alaska. Um, and so I say we were planning because we didn't go. We knew before we started that if we went, it would be an amazing adventure. I'm sure it would have impacted us, but it would have been about us, let's be honest, right? Um, and so we decided to call it off. A month before we were supposed to leave, we canceled the trip. Uh, we pulled back on everything, and we started turning our vision inward and saying, okay, why did we want to do this? What are the things that we actually wanted to accomplish? And how could we do those in a sense that would be far more sustainable? And sometimes I, I think sustainable is sort of a buzzword that has a lot of connotations, and I'm not sure I really like it, but don't know what else to use. Um, but, but at the end of the day, what could we do that would actually have some meaningful impact, not only larger than ourselves, but not about us, but actually working with, with folks to help them help themselves? And that's really what we wanted to do. And so that's kind of what laid the groundwork for what would become Revision. Originally, we were named Revision International. Well, actually, our incorporation documents when we started back in October of 2007 was Revision Network. That was our first name. Um, and then we were like, oh, that sounds horrible. So we said Revision International. Um, but we decided at the end of the day that there were plenty of folks in Denver in need. There, were pl there was plenty of injustice in Denver. And if we wanted to really, if we were really serious about doing some good in the world, that we should start in our own backyard. Uh, so that was the one, one thing that we thought about. The second was that um, in all of our research and, and sort of preparation for the trip, we identified food as that thing that could probably be one of those conversation starters, a foot in the door, not only with, with individual people but with communities that could lead to larger scale change in that community. Um, and so we always thought of food as the vehicle towards larger change. We were never um, solely focused on food in our concepts and our philosophy. We were always focused on this idea of community development, of empowering communities to help themselves. And so, but we, we saw food as this powerful agent for that change. Um, so we started um, our mission. Our mission statement is to work with people in marginalized neighborhoods to develop leaders, cultivate community food systems, and grow resilient local economies. So it's kind of a, a, a nice sentence, um, but at the end of the day, this, this statement tries to capture three things that we care deeply about, and really in the order that we care about them and that we try to do the work. The first is developing local leaders, um, which we've sort of called, it's sort of hard to see here, reunite um, as sort of the, how we talk about this. But developing local leaders, this idea that, as I mentioned in Nicaragua, um, we saw so many outside organizations coming in and saying, we have the answers, you have the need, here you go. Um, whereas, really, the people that I met there, they had the answers. They were the ones that knew what they wanted. They were the ones that knew what the issues were, why they were there, and what they wanted to do about them, right? Maybe they lacked some resources. Maybe they lacked some organization. Maybe they lacked some things. But it wasn't us that had the answers to give to them. It was them that just needed some help, right? And so um, developing local leaders is all about this idea of working to identify the leaders that are already in a community, empowering them with what they need to mobilize their community. And they're the ones that actually do the work. And I'll get to what that looks like in a moment. The second strategy, as I mentioned, creating community food systems, we call it reform. This is our most tangible work. Um, and as I mentioned, food is that, that foot in the door, that thing that really brings people together, not only philosophically, but physically. Um, and it's that thing that everyone can agree on. When I say that in a co-op room, everyone's like, no, no one can agree on it. Uh, but really, everyone can agree in philosophy that everyone should have access to healthy food. I can say that statement, and if you shake your head, there's going to be problems, right? Everyone can agree on that concept. And so what we know is that the communities that we started working with, and I'll get to who they are in a moment, um, they care deeply about food. And they care deeply about the injustice of the fact they didn't have access to, to local food. Um, not, sorry, not local food, but healthy food. Um, and so that's where we wanted to start 
is developing community food systems. And I'll get to what that looks like, but it's really built on this idea of the, developing the local leaders to create the food systems. We're not the ones doing the work for the community. The community is organizing themselves to do the work. Um, and again, it, it's all around food. And then finally, in, in philosophy, this re-own program is all about the idea that our work should not end at charity. Our work should not end at, if there's a downturn in the economy, they have the jobs that get cut the, fir the first, right? Um, and so, in essence, if we want to build their own community wealth and their own capacity, um, then we need to have more resiliency in the economic system. And we view food and developing local leaders as the pathway towards that, or one of the pathways. Um, so, where are we? Um, we're in Denver, and how many of you have been to Denver? Most of you, great. Wonderful city. Um, and so downtown Denver is up there on the upper right. The Platte River kind of runs through. You can kind of see the blue line. We're centered in the community of Westwood. Um, and you'll see as I go through this that we're not just about that one neighborhood, um, but that the, we're really about trying to build a place based. Um, and so we're focused in southwest Denver. Um, West Colfax, by the way, you saw their logo up um, on the sign. So West Colfax is up on Colfax Avenue. And they haven't doubt, got a location yet, but they're going to be somewhere up on that top line. Northeast Community Market, you also saw their logo up there. They're trying to start up on the east side. They also don't have a location yet, but they have um, many members and, and very good organizations. So we're all working together in the Denver area on the co-op side, which I'll get to. Um, but the Westwood neighborhood, as, as the sort of paragraph in the brochure says, um, it's the densest neighborhood in Denver. However, it's mostly single family homes. So most of the single family homes have multiple generations living in them with more than six people per house. Um, it's the youngest neighborhood in Denver. About 33% of the population is under 18. Uh, it's highly immigrant, uh, mostly Hispanic Latino, um, about 80% Hispanic Latino community, um, mostly first generation immigrants, um, largely from Mexico. Um, it's the second poorest neighborhood in Denver. Um, and and what we've found in, in a lot of other ways is that, as, all you know, as you all know, statistics fall woefully short in describing a community, right? This is a vibrant place. The people there are amazing. I live, um, you'll see in, in, our, in our maps, as I mentioned, we work in Westwood and the surrounding neighborhoods. I live about basically on the top line of the, of the line of Westwood right there in the community. Um, but it's an amazing place. The culture is extremely vibrant but it's been neglected by public investment and by infrastructure and everything else for decades. Um, you walk around, there's no sidewalks or intermittent sidewalks. There's no street lighting. Um, the traffic, there's multiple pedestrian fatalities um, on Morrison Road, which we'll get to in a moment, which is a main road that bisects the community. Um, and so it's a, it's a community with amazing assets and facing, community and facing amazing challenges, right? The, the people there are amazing people. And they also have lived there for a long time. We're not talking about, even though it's a largely immigrant community, most of the families that have lived there have lived there for at least five, 10 years, some of them far more than that. Um, and so it's a relatively stable community. Um, as I mentioned in a session yesterday that, that Dave was facilitating, we are facing massive gentrification pressures, though, um, which we can get to in a moment. So when we first started um, in 2009, our idea with community food systems was not trying to get a grocery store to plop down to fix the food desert problem, um, but instead empower individual families to help start growing their own food through backyard gardens. Um, we felt that if families could learn how to grow their own food, that one, they would be the change makers themselves. They're in charge of their own diet to a certain extent. Um, they would have no access issues. All they have to do is walk out their back door. And third, they would be more resilient as a family. Right? They would be less prone, less vulnerable to those shocks in the food prices if they could start growing some of their own. Um, and initially, it just stopped there. That was our idea. Let's help families start growing their own food. We started in 2009 with seven families. Um, and the model was not just based on dropping off all the supplies, so compost, drip irrigation systems, seeds, seedlings, all that stuff, but also partnering with the families throughout the year. So visiting them once a week and teaching them what the difference between a weed and a basil plant is, or how to harvest what they grew, or how to cook with what they grow. And we found throughout that first year, this is not about a garden. 
right? The garden was the foot in the door. This is about the relationship. And the trust that was built, and initially it was Eric going to each one of these families and building that relationship. That relationship was an amazing stepping off point uh, between these families starting to build trust with Eric and, and him starting to realize these families, yes, they're struggling with food, but they also have so many other issues that they're facing. And that trust was the ability that Eric had to be able to hear those issues from families and work with them to help them solve their own issues. And so we found that the relationship was what it was all about. And we just happened to be growing, helping them grow food as, as sort of a tangible thing. But we also realized that at the end of the day, it was Eric, the white boy from just across town at the time, um, working with these Hispanic Latino families, right? It was amazing work, trust was built, but there were only seven families. And there was 65 families that wanted to participate the next year, right? So one issue is that Eric <laughs> can't go around to 65 families and help them start gardens and actually build that relationship with 65 families. Two, he sort of speaks Spanish. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, right? I mean, a lot of us sort of speak Spanish. Um, but really, at the end of the day, he was not the right person to be doing that work, right? He was not the right person to be going into people's homes and try to build a relationship. It was the community members themselves that should be doing it. And so we adapted what's called a promotora model. How many of you have heard of the promotora model? Yeah, community health work. So it's largely used in the public health sort of sector industry, largely by international organizations that are learning that if they just go into a community and provide a hand washing training, let's say, um, and then they leave, the adoption rate and the usage rate is so low, right? But if they go into a community, find the local leaders, empower them, train them on how to wash hands, and teach them how to teach others, then when that organization leaves, those community members are still there. They're the ones that are best suited to disseminate that information. So we saw that model and we saw its effectiveness and we said, well, what if we adapted that to backyard gardens, right? We, we find the community leaders that are there, we train and hire them, give them jobs to go around and work with these families. And so that's how, that's how the, the Promotora model that we use got started. And what we refer to as reunite or that developing local leaders. Um, Patricia is right in the middle. She was our, one of our first three um, promotoras back in 2010, Perla and Yuridia. Um, these women are uh, key leaders in the community. They're the people that everyone calls um, when something goes wrong or something goes right or there's a celebration or a death or a birth or anything, right? They're so connected to the community. And so these women are now the ones that are going around and helping the families not only start the garden, but then working with them, building that relationship throughout the year. Um, so they, they go around uh, and they help um, individual families plant the gardens. Um, what's amazing about this model is not just the sort of resiliency factor in my mind of helping families start producing some of their own food, but it's also that the kids are involved, right? It's the whole family. Um, when kids, we all probably have heard, I don't have kids, um, but I've heard, <laughs> and I remember, I hated broccoli, I hated vegetables, right? Um, but when the kids grow them, they can't wait to eat them, right? They're yanking up carrots and eating them with dirt still on it, right? I mean, they're just excited. That's good for them, right? They need those microbes. Um, so that's been another amazing, um, I call it a byproduct, but, but it's, it's, it's just part of what's going on, right? Is that the whole family is learning from the garden. And even though the garden is seasonal, we see that families are changing their eating habits throughout the year. And so where the kids used to go and get Doritos for a snack, some families are saying, my kid now wants a cucumber for a snack in the middle of February, right? They're not growing it in their garden, but now that kid wants a cucumber instead of the box of Doritos or a bag of Doritos. So that's some, some amazing things that we're seeing. And the growth um, has been pretty amazing. So I, I mentioned, I saw this, or I showed the slide just now, that's seven families in 2009. Um, 2010, we worked with 38, oh gosh. Uh, we'll get there. Oh, maybe? Okay, there it is. So 2010, 38 families. Uh, 2011, 87, I think. 2012, 168. 200, 300, 400 last year. And this year we're looking at working with 450. So the, the growth has been astronomical, right? And it's not... There's no advertising. There's no 
um, billboards or flyers, it's all word of mouth. Right? One family refers another, one family sees their next door neighbor having a garden and so they want to start their own, they reach out. So this, this is part of what we wanted to, to do when we started about talking about creating community food systems. We're not talking about a garden here or there, we're ta starting to talk about almost on every block in this area, somebody is starting to grow their own food. There's this awareness, there's this connection to food. So we're starting to see a critical mass of families getting engaged with food again in a way that they haven't been able to prior. Um, and this is, for us, um, a huge precursor to the Westwood Food Cooperative and our story of the Westwood Food Cooperative, is now these 400 families want healthier food, they're able to access it right now, and they want to be involved in, in increasing that access for others. So you can kind of see that Westwood Food Co-op um, marker right there. It does have a site, and I'll get there in a moment. So we have a physical location, um, and we're working on the capital campaign to do the renovations and things like that. So that's sort of the backyard garden model, which we, I mentioned we call Reform. So back to Denver, I just want to give you a little bit of context. Remember, there's Westwood right there. The property, I'll start to transition into the story of the property. So Morrison Road is this diagonal road that used to be how cows were brought into the slaughter plants downtown. Um, Westwood, the, the neighborhood, was actually all farmland and was one of the last neighborhoods annexed into Denver um, in, the, in the 40s. And so you look back at aerial images, and when we were purchasing this property, we got aerial images from back from the 30s. And it was all 5, 10, 15 acre plots with a single farm home. Uh, and then you see every decade thereafter starting to pop up and develop. So it's really interesting. But the good news in that, from the gardening perspective, his, historically it's farmland. It's not uh, factories, it's not chemical plants. And so we've been incredibly fortunate in that regard that we do not have a history of contamination in this neighborhood. And that's been really, really incredible for us. So Morrison Road is, the, is this diagonal road. As I mentioned, pedestrian fatalities, there's many every year right on this road. The traffic goes two ways. Um, it's a major commuter artery down into downtown, because it sort of cuts off a corner down there. Um, and this particular property, which is outlined like that, oh, one of my lines is missing. Um, you can kind of see it's kind of a weird shape. It's actually 1.7 acres. It's right on Morrison Road. And it's, historically, it's a junkyard. It's been um, overgrown weed trees, semi-trailers. You can see them, mobile home trailers that are just abandoned. Um, junk everywhere. It's a center. It was a center for vandalism, crime, um, all sorts of, of things that, that the community was concerned about, right? And that, in general, you think about when you think about a blighted neighborhood, you think about properties like this was. Um, in 2014, um, based on a lot of revisions work and, and knowing that we wanted to take it to the next step of helping the community open a grocery store, the city of Denver approached Revision, and we had been working with them on a few smaller projects, but the Office of Economic Development told us, hey, look, we have some extra funds. You always like to hear those words, right? And if you guys can purchase this property in the next nine months and close in the next nine months, we'll give you the money you need to do it. Um, $1.3 million. So this property was not for sale. The owner didn't want to sell. Um, and so all of a sudden we were like, oh, okay, sure, we can make a commercial real estate deal happen when we've never done that before with an owner that doesn't want to sell. Uh, and on a site that most likely has environmental issues, right, based on its use. Um, so it was, a, it was a roller coaster ride, and I'm pleased to say that we did in fact purchase it. Uh, we went in and out of contract with the owner multiple times over that period. Uh, the State Department of Public Health and Environment donated uh, full phase one and phase two environmental um, assessments, which miraculously found no contamination at all. Uh, both groundwater and soil testing turned up nothing. There was some asbestos on the site, but nothing huge. Um, this large warehouse down on the bottom here, it's about 10,000 square feet, was partially collapsed. Um, so there was a lot of things that we knew we were buying with the property. Um, a lot of the junk ended up coming with it as well, um, <laughs> thanks to the previous tenants and owner. But at the end of the day, September 26, 2014, we closed on the property. 
We got the keys. We had to wait for three months um, to let the tenants move out. They were entitled to uniform relocation assistance. Um, and then January 1st, 2015 is when we actually sort of got in there and started to get to work. Uh, and really, it's been a transformation. So this is what it looked like when we purchased it from the, from the aerial view. And this is what it looks like today. Um, so it's, we're sort of at a, a blank slate now. Um, so this whole back, ha this back acre, we call it, here, we're going to be turning into an urban farm. And I'll get into all the different components in a moment. But this was that warehouse that was partially collapsed. It had some asbestos contamination in it. So we abated the asbestos. We tore down the warehouse. Um, we sort of moved off all the junk. So we took off, if you can picture those huge 40 cubic yard dumpsters, we took off about 30 of those um, full of just straight up trash. And then about another 30 or 40 of those of scrap metal recycling. So we're just talking about a massive cleanup effort, right? And this has been, it's been an amazing journey to see the neighbors, to see the community start to say, oh man, that property doesn't look like a community blight anymore. It looks like opportunity, right? Um, so it's been a really cool journey to just clean up the property. And really, we haven't done anything else. We've cleaned it up. And that's where we are right now, um, as far as the physical property goes. But that's been an amazing opportunity to reach out to more folks in the community, to have more folks get involved, and to see this could actually be something that we own, right? That we can ha take pride in and say, this that was a junkyard is now um, our, our home for, for, for fresh, healthy food. <clears throat> so that's sort of been our, our motto from, from health disparity to health prosperity. Um, and this is, a, this is actually inside that old warehouse that we tore down. Um, and it was just a really cool um, sort of juxtaposition, right? There was a grocery cart there. And we thought, how cool is that image to see the grocery cart in front of all this trash inside of this old falling down warehouse and think, what if that grocery cart was actually sitting in a grocery store that the community owned, right? It's just we felt, felt it was a really powerful image. So this is, I'm just going to walk through a few of the components that are going to be on the, on the property because this is important to understand in context of a Westwood Food Cooperative. It's not going to have the whole property. And this is why I started with revision is to help contextualize where the Westwood Food Cooperative is and where revision is. And they're very like this right now, but um, I think there's a clearer line that's, that's becoming visible. Um, so first off, um, Revision is going to have its offices um, on the property. One of the old buildings is about 2,000, 2,500 square feet. We're just going to be renovating into our offices. Um, another community coalition called Westwood Unidos, um, they are a coalition of organizations and residents that's been really active in increasing built environment safety. So things like uh, cleaning up alleys, creating safe routes to school. Um, they actually are opening, and they just opened, um, a community education and fitness center in a, tall, in a small building on, on the property. Um, part of the design is to create open space. Um, this community is incredibly lacking in open space. Um, and so this idea, and that combined with the fact that it's a heavily Hispanic Latino community, they want a plaza. They want that place where if you go out walking as a family on a Sunday, you walk to the plaza, right? Um, it's a place to gather, it's a place to hang out, it's a place maybe you can buy food, those sorts of things. So we're going to be building um, courtyards, plazas on the property. The Westwood Food Cooperative, which I'll get to, and don't pay too much attention to the square footage numbers, we'll talk about that um, in a moment. Incubator Kitchen, um, and so this is something that's been really important for us in, in this journey of increasing economic opportunities. And so this is Again, even though that it will be inside the building envelope with the grocery store, this is probably going to be mostly run by revision, right? A brand new co-op probably doesn't have the capacity to run an incubator kitchen. Um, but there's so many folks in the neighborhood that have amazing recipes, that want to start their own businesses, that want to get their own two feet under them and be their own bosses as opposed to being at the whims of the local economy. And so um, an incubator kitchen has been incredibly needed. There's a huge commissary kitchen down the street but they charge $20, $30, $40 dollars an hour to use the space, right? And if, if you want to get a space, you have to go there at 2 in the morning. So any community member that has three jobs, two jobs, is not going to go down there and pay that money to go and try to figure out a recipe, right? Or try to figure out how to create a product that they want to market. And so how can we create a pipeline for community residents 
that starts with an incubator kitchen, developing their own products, and then moving into a space where they can start their own businesses. Finally, a greenhouse. Um, so we were donated a greenhouse structure from an, a nursery that went out of business, and that'll be on the property as part of the urban farm. Again, this will be providing inputs to our backyard garden program, but it's also a job training facility and also trying to create um, another social enterprise that's creating economic wealth for the community. Um, and will eventually, our hope is that it will eventually either become a part of the Westwood Food Cooperative as a separate business, but cooperatively owned, um, or it will become its own cooperative altogether. So you can kind of see, the, you recognize the, the layout of the site um, back in this area, this whole back acre urban farm, greenhouse down here, community gathering space and courtyard plazas here and here, uh, and then the, the grocery store building is up on the top there, which we'll get to. So that's sort of revision, um, and hopefully that lays the groundwork for the Westwood Food Cooperative. And so I'll, I want to walk through sort of the logistics of, of how the cooperative started, um, where, what the different stages have been, and then I just kind of want to stop talking and, and open it up for questions or discussion. Um, I'm sure there's things that I'm glossing over or am not covering, and so please feel free to ask any and all questions that you might have. Um, so this has sort of been a, a timeline to capture just the Westwood Food Cooperative. And so back in 2012, Dave mentioned going to Cooperation Works, their cooperative certification program. He went through that with um, my colleague, uh, Revisions Executive Director Eric Kornacki, um, in 2012. And so Eric came back from that experience and through that experience and realized the cooperative model is where it's at, right? The cooperative model is, is the form in which we can help the community do what they want to do, which is have a grocery store, right? And instead of trying to lobby for the King Supers or the Safeways or the, um, the there's a Mi Pueblo market that's a very, um, very cheap uh, grocery store, but you walk in, it has flies on the produce. Like, it's just not a, not a good place. Instead of lobbying for them to come into the neighborhood, what if the community could own its own grocery store? So we started, started having those conversations back in 2012. If you remember the number of gardens we had back then, about 200 families. Um, and so this conversation caught fire. And the, the community um, saw the cooperative model as the answer. And so Eric was able to help kind of guide those conversations and say, this is what it looks like, this is how it could be structured, what do you guys think? And so we did a lot of listening sessions, a lot of brainstorming with the community and our community promotoras, that team of community members that, that we train uh, and hire to do the work. Um, really 2012, 2013, and the, the momentum kind of built into April 2014 when we had a, a community board of seven community members say, let's get this thing started, and we filed incorporation papers as sort of our first thing. We hadn't done anything else. We had gathered multiple times to figure out that we wanted this, and then we're like, okay, let's just file legal paperwork, right? That's the first good step. Um, so legally, it is a multi-stakeholder multi cooperative, and this reflects revision, uh, and will present many, many challenges, <laughs> um, but it, it's designed to be a producer, worker, and consumer cooperative. The producer is built on this fact that there are 400 families right now growing their own food in the community. And they want a way to be able to sell that produce um, and gain a little bit of cash from that and also sort of have this idea of not only is this my grocery store and I own it, but that's my tomato right there and I grew that, right? And so there's this idea of community participation that goes beyond just consumer member ownership and into production. And we wanted to capture that. Consumer members, and this is um, when I get to where we're at in our membership campaign right now, we're only recruiting consumer members at the moment. Obviously, without a store, uh, it's hard to have worker members and producer members. Um, Revision, as the organization that, that is helping to start this, and as sort of the incubator or technical assistance provider for the Westwood Food Cooperative, is what's called in the bylaws a founding member, um, which gives Revision the right to name two people to seat, seat, two seats on the board of directors. Um, the bylaws state the board has to have 12 members at least, or up to 12 members, and then two additional can be appointed by revision. And so the idea that revision wants to be able to help guide this cooperative, but doesn't want the power, right? Two seats out of 12 is by no means a majority. And so we're hoping that through this structure, 
over time, revision really starts to distance itself, and the cooperative starts to distance itself from revision because it's on its own and operating. And if revision wants to have two seats, then it can have that, that ability. As I mentioned, we started with a community um, board of seven, seven folks. Um, revision was able to get some, um, some funding in the door uh, to do a market study and trade area analysis. Um, so I'll just kind of go through these relatively quickly. Um, this is a, a com com competitor analysis. Um, so this is Westwood here, Morrison Road, and the property's right about there. Um, each sort of area is where food sales happen. And if they're green, there's not very many sales. If they're red, there's a lot. Um, and then it's sort of the amount that it expands outward also denotes the amount of sales there are. And so you can kind of see this, there's a main boulevard along Federal, um, but all those sales, this is including um, prepared foods, right? So there's, there's almost no grocery sales in the neighborhood. Um, I think I might have it on a future slide, but in the trade area that we're looking at, which we sort of did three, we identified three different rings. And this green ring on the inside is about three minutes away from the cooperative, or about one mile. And that's what our primary trade area is. And there's about 6,000 households that live in there, um, 21,000 residents. Um, they spend collectively about $16 million a year on groceries, but 13.5 million of that is spent outside that trade area, right? So we have a lot of leakage, um, and we have the ability to say, look, if you, if you could shop within that one mile radius, you could walk there. And if we can capture 10%, 20% of that um, trade area's leakage, then we're, we're looking at a very healthy business plan, right? The, the next area out is uh, five minutes or about two miles, and then we have 10 minutes. In both the five and the 10 minute, there's, there's surplus. Right? That's where the food sales are happening, and people from outside those trade areas are coming in to purchase food. And so we, yes, sir? Is that only grocery sales, not including restaurants? Correct. Okay. Yep, only grocery sales. Um, and so the average family, I'll just back up a little bit. In the trade area, the average family spends about $3,500 a year on groceries, according to the data. So if you think about that, that's not very much money, especially for one of the densest communities in, in the city of Denver, right? We're talking about $10 a day for food, um, which is not much for a whole family. And so price is the main thing for families in this neighborhood. They want quality, they want fresh. Most of them want chemical-free, they call it, or organic. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at $10 to feed your family for the day, you're not gonna purchase the organic tomatoes next to the conventional ones, right? But if you purchase tomatoes at all, that's a win because you're not necessarily purchasing the heavily processed alternatives, um, which lead to a lot of the, the health issues the community is experiencing. Um, in the red boundary, um, it's about 40 million a year. Sorry, no it's not. It's 70 million a year in that, in that red boundary. In the blue boundary, 10 minutes, that includes downtown and a lot of other more affluent areas, more like 400 million. Um, so there's massive spending potential, but what we're trying to do is create a business plan that's focused on that, that one mile trade area. Those are the residents that really need it. Those are the residents that are gonna be able to walk there. Those are the residents that actually um, wanna be able to shop at their own store. And it, we will pull in what, we're, what we call values-based shoppers from outside, right? The folks that are willing to drive just because it's a co-op or are willing to drive for the experience, we'll get into look and feel in a minute. Um, but that's, we're really designing the store for those folks in that trade area. So when we did our community surveys, 80% of the community reported traveling up to eight miles to buy their groceries. Um, and so as I mentioned, there's, there's $13.5 million of leakage in that one mile area. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there's a lot of corner stores. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, I was, but, but this survey was really, um, took that into account. Yeah, so, yes, thank you. So the, the families that were getting their sort of 
um, bulk of their groceries that they use to prepare their meals, they report traveling up to eight miles away. If they're going for a quick bag of chips or whatever alternatives the local corner stores have, um, then that was not necessarily thought about in the 80% number. Just one more question. Yeah. So is there any like healthy corner store initiatives in Denver? Or, you know, I mean, has, that, has there been efforts to get more produce into the corner store? Yes. So Denver uh, Environmental Health, the local environmental health um, department is starting or has started a healthy corner store initiative. Um, there are four corner stores as of now. I think one just recently joined in the Westwood neighborhood. Um, but you don't have to actually sell f healthy food to be a part of that coalition. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a coalition to work towards providing healthier options, which is great. And Revision on the side is working um, to develop its own distribution capacity to, to start filling some of the distribution gaps because that's one of the main barriers for, for the, the store owners is finding, sourcing healthier options for their stores. Um, but yeah, so there's a healthy corner store initiative not necessarily resulting in more access to healthy food at the moment. What time is this done? 10.45? I want to just talk about the look and feel real quick, and then I just want to stop. And I've been talking for way too long. <laughs> and we'll just do some question and answers um, that will probably end up covering what I was going to cover anyways. So the look and feel. So I mentioned designing this store for that primary trade area. Um, Maria is highlighted in the middle. That's the name of our target customer. Um, we did a lot of work with the community and the board of directors of the co-op thinking about who is it that we think will shop here and who is it that we want to shop here. So Maria is a 30-something mother. Um, she is Hispanic, uh, probably from Mexico. Um, she probably has a job, but probably not a traditional full-time 9 to 5 job. Right? She, she might clean office buildings downtown. Um, she might do other non-traditional sort of work. But largely, she's at home working with the kids, tending the garden, um, those sorts of things. Her husband is usually the quote-unquote breadwinner for the family, working probably in the trades, in construction or other, um, either construction or service-related industries. But Maria is probably going to want to come and shop with her kids. She doesn't have the luxury of childcare. She can't afford that, so she wants to bring her kids. Uh, and she wants not only to feel welcome in this store and hear the language that she speaks from the people that work in the store, but she also wants an experience for her kids, right? She wants to be able to engage with them in the shopping experience and not just say, hush, hush, don't say anything or don't grab anything, right? And so how can we design a store that really does try to appeal to the entire family and not just to the adults? Um, some of the words around the edge are just some of the, the values that the co-op board of directors came up with, with what do we really care about and what should drive our product purchasing, our store look and feel, those sorts of things. So I just found it interesting they, they all said dirt. Um, this idea that oftentimes we go to the grocery store and the produce section is all polished, right? There's no thought of, well, this carrot did come from the dirt, right? And if there's a little bit of dirt, that's actually OK. So this idea that we want authent authenticity in the food and in the market. Um, so I'll kind of leave it there. We're at about 225 members right now. Um, which has largely been outreach to Revision's uh, network and not been uh, guided by the Westwood Food Cooperative. And so the last thing I'll say is that there's, there is this challenge, right, of Revision has been sort of one of the catalyzers and the organizers for this that's based on years of community organizing and community grassroots sort of work. Um, but right now, Revision has all the capacity. And so we're looked to for a lot of the work. Right? which is great and not so great. Um, and so there's, there's a challenge right now in figuring out, we just had new board of directors elections, which is great to get some new, new blood in the, in the room. But now we're looking at how can the co-op itself take the reins more? How can it start doing its own membership campaign? Which really, I mean, the 225 members was like, that's kind of the low-hanging fruit. Like, we didn't have to work all that hard to get the 225 members. But we want to have 750 members by the end of the year. We want to have um, over 1,000 before we open the grocery store portion. Um, and so the co-op needs to start doing the work. And, and we have a really new active chair of our membership committee, and she's just 
taken off with it. So it's really exciting to see, hopefully, a little bit more of a divergence, right? Where revision can start just being there if needed, and less in the driver's seat of making being the ones actually doing a lot of the work. Um, what questions do you all have? Yeah. For revision, um, Eric and I held a few uh, fundraisers and sold some t-shirts. And so that was how we got started. It took us, um, the growth in the organization has sort of mirrored the growth in the Backyard Garden program. Um, it's kind of crazy for us right now to think we have about 25 team members. Um, and our monthly budget right now is what our annual budget was back in 2010. So the, the growth has been insane. And now it's largely from private foundations. Uh, we do have a few government grants, the USDA and state level. Um, individual donors, corporate sponsors, events, those sorts of things. Yes, sir. Um, I might have missed this earlier, but the thought behind the square footage for retail. So thank you. The square footage for retail, um, and one of the reasons I sort of glossed over that was that's the space that the property has. So the property has a, a beautiful old, beautiful is not the right word, falling apart old bow trust warehouse. It's about 3,600 square feet. Um, and so when we purchased the property, that, was, that is and was the space where the grocery store makes the most sense on that property. Um, with, so there was about 1,400 square feet of back of house, largely commercial kitchen space that when, when um, Jacqueline up at the front was mentioning that the Denver co-ops are working together, one of the things we're trying to do is that we'll, we'll house the kitchen, we'll house the commercial kitchen and do most of the prepared foods work for the other co-ops. Uh, so that they don't have to try to raise the capital to build their own kitchens. Um, so the back of house is a bit bigger proportionally, I think, than it would need to be for its own operations. Um, but that's where the 2,200, so it's 22 to 2,400 square foot retail floor in the current plans. Yes, sir. Uh, you did a fantastic job. You Thank you, sir. Yeah. See, yes, and not fully. No. Both at the same time. <laughs> that business plan is going to be your Bible for your business. Yeah. And once you do it and it's done correctly, then you'll be able to uh, uh, progress in a controlled fashion. Because if you don't, I mean, you got so much going on, something may, may fall off the shelf. My sentiments exactly. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Did you have another question? Uh, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. No, they weren't. Um, none of them actually had a uh, growing background. Um, so we, when we went into uh, or decided to work with Westwood residents, it was partly because we partnered with an organization that had already been working there called Live Well Westwood. Um, there's a larger, it's called Live Well Colorado movement in Colorado. Um, but they, that organization had been doing a lot of community engagement and listening and identified sort of jobs, food, and safety as the top three things this community really cared about. And through that process, they had met the women that we initially started working with. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Brittany. I'd like, I'd like to hear more about your capital campaign, and then also second question about um, how you're also partnering with the other co-ops in Denver. Yeah. So the capital campaign is twofold, um, or it has two sides, I guess I would say. One is part of the reason that revision is at the table is to help make sure that the co-op doesn't have to take on too much debt service, right? I mean, you all know. Grocery businesses are not high-margin businesses to begin with. 
let alone when you're talking about opening one in a food desert in a low-income community, there's a lot of price challenges. And so the, the lower the debt service can be that the co-op opens its doors with, um, the more chance it has of success. So that's part of the reason, that's part of the role that Revision is helping to play, is helping with the fundraising, right? So Revision as a 501c3 has a capital campaign that's designed to build out everything on the site, build a grocery store, equipment, everything, kitchen, uh, and then the co-op comes in and leases that. And then the co-op is responsible for hiring the staff, the startup inventory, the other sort of soft cost startup expenses. But they don't have to be on the hook for the capital, the, the sort of hard capital dollars. So the capital campaign for the property development as a whole is $2.1 million. Um, we have about 675,000 raised right now. And we're starting to look at a phased uh, construction plan to start spending the dollars that we have providing community benefit and getting folks on the site right now without having to wait until the whole thing is raised. Because the property is so large, we have a bit of flexibility in that arena. Did that answer your question? OK. Uh, I think you were next, and then we'll go back. We have 225 members. And I should say we have uh, offer an annual membership and a lifetime membership. So our, our annual fee is $40. Our lifetime is 200, and so and we also we have a payment plan that you can use if you want the lifetime. Um, and our initial uh, one of the reasons we got to 225 uh, quickly was that we said for the first 100 members in each category, 15 dollars for the annual, 150 for the lifetime. And it's amazing. I mean, these families are struggling, but most of them chose the 150 lifetime, um, and so they really do want to invest in this co-op, and that's. So that's where we are right now. Yeah, I think in the middle and then up here. Um, we have a, um, I'm coming money balances uh, because you're a not for profit. Revisionist. Revisionist. Is, mm -hmm. is doing all the build out. Mm -hmm. But the co op is just doing the basic fundraising for its software costs and the lease. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Okay, so in our in our town we have um, we started a foundation that we call Shared Harvest Educational Found Educational Foundation Chef, and we are con we concerned that we have to stick to only educational spending of the foundation money. Mm -hmm. So we can't spend. They can't. We can't take funds and put it into the capital campaign. That's not mm -hmm. allowed. How do you work around that? Well, I'm not familiar with, I know there are differences between a 501c3 private charity, as they're called by the IRS, and a private foundation. So if, if you're a foundation, I'm not, I can't speak to your regulations. So maybe that's the difference. But for revision, any money that we spend that's related to our mission is considered tax exempt. Um, so this is our mission to build resilient local economies, which is the case we make for doing the capital campaign. Oh. So up here and, and then back to Gloria. Okay. So I can email you. Okay. And oh, I do have my contact information up. There we go. Do you know if these are going to be available online, all the questions? I, they said they were putting them on flash drives, oh, all the presentations. Oh, oh that's on the flash drive. There you go. Uh, so it is a Prezi. I kind of weird. I didn't do a PowerPoint, but Gloria. Yeah. Well, just my question is: when you were speaking during your presentation, is there that's the only group of um, people in that community? And so, so are there other um, communities that you all are looking at? Yeah. So I, I'll answer the question, but I did want to just say we are at time. So if you would like to leave, thank you so much for coming.